It's my truth. It's my truth. Don't judge this book by the cover, for my essence is like a myth. I'm strong, I'm gentle. With undying faith, my dimensions go beyond the fifth. If only you'd seek, then in me you'll find, for my legacy is my proof. It's pure and unadulterated. Can you handle my naked truth? Naked truth. This is my truth. My naked truth. Now this is my naked truth. My naked truth. And this is my naked truth. don't think that they can get it. They think they're invincible. And I try to tell all of my friends, my male friends, as well as my female friends, that it's out there. A lot of times they really don't see that it's really affecting young people. I grew up in the projects, Mount Haven projects. And um, I mean, it was not even talked about. It wasn't as devastating as it is now. It crosses all economic social lines. It crosses all educational lines. It crosses gender lines, and we need to take a serious look at what's going on. Because if we're not, we're gonna lose a generation of people. The first family member to die was my younger brother, Austin. HIV don't have no name, it don't discriminate, it don't care what color you are. You could be HIV positive for 15 years and not ever have any symptoms. When I found out I was HIV positive, I wasn't using condoms. I never had really had my mom around to explain to me about the safe sex and the things that come with it. So. We have to believe that it's strictly up to us to protect ourselves. At first he denied it and everything, but um, he came clean and he said, yeah, it's my fault. I was messing with a, a IV drug user. And I had this fever that would not break. And it's so funny, this doctor came up to me and said, listen, we can't break your feet. Do, do you have it? Do you have AIDS? And I said, AIDS, are you crazy? Because only gay people get AIDS. AIDS is anyone can get it, first off. So it's not no gay disease or anything. AIDS is human, like any human can get it. It's blood contact. We didn't do a good job in this country with this public health information. We gave you the wrong information. We heard it was a white gay male disease in California. What ridiculous information is that? This is a virus. It can go anywhere, anytime, and it did. So even in those early days, this disease was in people of color, but we didn't know it. I was with a girl, uh, it was just like, I did because I wanted people to accept me. I wanted to be like everybody else, so I did it with the girl, so. My name is Randolph Jackson, I'm 15, and uh, I'm gay. I didn't want, really want to be different. I didn't want to be like ridiculed or teased like some of the other people I've seen. Yeah, sure, it would be a lot better to me if he were straight, it would be easier. Not so much better, but easier. But the fact that he's gay, I have no problems with saying, okay, this is my son, he's gay, and I still love him. My name is Latoya Renee Ricks. I'm 20 years old, and my sexual orientation, I like to consider myself a femininity chaser. Latoya's my best friend. We've been friends since seventh grade, like 97, nonstop. She's like my backbone. <laughs> I can't live without her. What I do has nothing to do with you, so you have no right to judge me. You know, I'm, I'm a human being just like anybody else, so 
I expect you to treat me like one. Most young black men are thought to be, like, I mean, are supposed to be strong, like, well brought up hardcore men. They're supposed to, like, protect other people, like, protect their girl. I frequently have calls from parents, uh, especially fathers, especially black fathers, who are afraid that their son uh, may, be, may be gay. Yeah, this, this whole issue of sexuality is extremely complex, and, you know, it, it's very simplistic to think of straight and gay. And it's interesting because my father will now say, and he said to me, son, I know you were born that way. Because I think they saw at times this internal struggle I had to please them and to not be gay. African American, Hispanic um, cultures, um, things like that, they look down upon homosexuality, so it's more of a hush-hush type thing. I, I've been called a dyke, I've been called when nobody ever called me anything to my face, so I don't know what they're saying, but the, the, mo the most popular word is a dyke, and, and I really can, I do not like that word at all whatsoever. I really do not. People trying to label me and put me in the boxes and, you know, people feeling uncomfortable because they, they're assuming that I'm gay, first of all. You know, they don't know. From a public health point of view, we want to know whether or not an individual engages in activity that can transmit disease, and if they do, what type of activity they engage in. Their sexual identity is, from a health point of view, a less important issue. You know, people look at me and say, she don't have the AIDS virus, she's lying. She looked too good, that's the point. It doesn't matter how good you look. Someone could be walking around, maybe not ill from physical that you can see, but internally they're ill, and you don't even know. So as beautiful and as gorgeous as I am, I have the AIDS virus. My status of HIV, I'm positive. This is how I feel about myself today. I am a woman. I am strong. I am beautiful. I am useful. You can tear down my heart, but I'll have my soul. You can try and take my future, but I'll have my dreams. You can try and hold me hostage, but my spirit will be free. See, I am a woman, just one woman. I'm strong, I'm beautiful, and I'm useful. It's my truth. My truth. It's my truth. You know, I didn't have the videos where the guys is, you know, you know, calling girls the B word and, you know, just like mistreating them. And I'm appalled. I'm pissed off and I'm offended and I don't care what you think about me for having that opinion because my breast shouldn't sell beer and my butt shouldn't sell videos. Uh, my name is Denise Stokes. I live in Stockbridge, Georgia. Some of the girls do emulate the type of things that they see in the videos but I think it's up to each person because some people they may have never seen the TV and they still might end up like that so I don't think it's necessarily all the media. Oh boy, we have some work to do. We've dropped the ball. I am a hip-hop fan. I love the hip-hop culture because I think it's so real. How about using that positive culture, and we do a lot in Atlanta, to get out this message about this package? My truth. Something happened in a person's spirit that either said to them, you're not worthy, you're not good enough, um, you, you, you don't count, you're not special, you're not joy, something. My mother used to say things to me when I was young, like, um, you ain't nothing, you ain't never gonna be nothing. <laughs> if we aren't taking care of ourselves, if we haven't really learned to express self-love, it's really impossible to put it out to other people. I didn't really have to deal with that. Only my my family is basically Toy's family because my family never really, you know, I don't really deal with them too much. So she said, "Ma, I have an interest in females," and I'm like, "In what way?" 
because I want you I wanted her to come out more and she say well I like females more than I like males and I say well maybe it's just a phase you're going through you know as you get older you probably change you know but whatever makes you happy you my child and it doesn't matter to me my mother, she found a magazine my friend had left over, and she was like, I came into my room. She was like, Brian, what is this um, doing in your drawer? And I was, I was the one who went off. I was like, what are you doing going through my drawer? And she just, um, I just put it back in the drawer, and I sat beside her and said, what's this on TV? And I'm saying, when we get me and her getting our little argument, she may call me something. It's one of the biggest mistakes parents make is they discover something, and then they just make an ultimatum. They say, no, you're not going to do this. And if, you, and if you continue to do it, then I'm going to withdraw my love from you, and I'm never going to talk to you again. Well, that really puts the child in a very untenable position because they can't then go out and have this dialogue with you that's very important for, to help their decision making. I had completely given up on life, and it was all shrouded through this haze of drugs and alcohol. And that's when I realized then, whatever it is that you want to put your energy into, the assistance will come. If you're seeking to destroy yourself, oh, there will be people around you who will gladly help you with that. But if you want to boost yourself up and be something greater, there are people who will come into your life who are willing to help with that too. When I first found out I was HIV positive, I was scared. I had a boyfriend. The hardest thing was telling him. Me, I just can't tell them, oh, I'm infected. I just can't do it. It's lonely, I can tell you that much. And uh, people, I, because people isolate you. I just told him I'm HIV positive. I'm like, really? You know, I'm like, yeah, what you think about that? You know, and they said, I think that you're a brave woman to come to me and tell me. Telling the truth sets folks free. Gay folks go through the same thing that the straight folks do. I think there's something about the human nature that is always able to find something to complicate something that really should be so simple. My first time telling anybody about myself was to my best friend, Eric, and I wasn't sure how he would take it, because a lot of times I would play about it and like try, I would want to tell him, and then I'd get like scared and I'd like back off from it. And so like one time, I think we were in um, computer lab or something. I was typing on a computer, and we were I'm aiming each other, and I aimed him that, and I said, I have something to tell you. And I told him, because I didn't really want to tell him to his face, because, I mean, I was scared. I, I mean, honestly, I was scared, because I wanted to keep my best friend, and I didn't want to lose him, and I didn't want him being angry or, like, not understanding that I'm still the same person or stuff like that. So he took it very well. <laughs> the toughest part of dealing with having your 13-year-old, in my case, tell you that he is gay is the worry that someone might hurt him based solely on that fact. As me and my father, um, we used to come like in physical altercations, but now things with us are better. And you know, we have a very good relationship as far as father and son. Uh, I try to be their friend first because I don't want to put myself out there like that. And then I try finding like signals or signs or something. And then if I feel that whatever, then I'll try and tell them stuff. I, I wouldn't choose this uh, on myself, because tell you the truth, if I had the ability, I would just like girls. Why would anybody want to choose to be gay? It baffles me. When you know that you're going to be faced with discrimination, when you know you're going to be harassed, you know you're going to be abused, it absolutely makes no sense that a person would want to choose to be gay. And there was always one or two people who would make some comment about um, me being a sissy or me being gay. I remember this guy asking one day, um, Tommy, do you wear dresses? 
but I was kind of strong and I shot back with, why do you want to borrow one? Because I hadn't been taught to cower to people. Um, I wasn't ashamed of who I and what I was, even though I was still exploring it. Young people who are in the gay community often feel a sense of isolation. And that sense of isolation is associated with uh, depression uh, that is much more common in, uh, in gay youth than in youth who are not gay. And those symptoms, those, those uh, mental health issues interfere with, number one, making decisions about prevention, but they also interfere in appropriate participation in health care provision. See, AIDS is not about just sex. AIDS is about racism. And AIDS is about classism and sexism and homophobia. And AIDS is about not being willing to be who you are and talk about what you do. AIDS is about judging the other person because it reminds you of something that you do that you just can't admit and you can't deal with. It's my truth. It's my truth. I knew from day one that our mission was to reach the unloved and love them, to find anybody who felt they were outside the circle and pull them in the circle. Um, I think it's important to have your family support because, I mean, that's, you know, you derive from your family, so it's, without your family support, it's kind of hard to, you know, be openly gay if your family doesn't accept you. My family relationships are the things that have kept me safe and alive through so many situations. No matter what's going on in my life at any particular time, I know that there's a group of people who loves me with unconditional regard, and that has made all the difference in the world. My brother's name is Joe. Well, his name is Joseph, but we call him Joe. And he's so special to me because out of all my immediate family, he is one that I did tell first. <laughs> oh. This is wow. This here is my handsome brother, Joe. He knew I wanted to tell the rest of the family. He never rushed me in and he said, whenever you are, I'll be right there with you. And here he is. I like to think that me and my son are a lot closer than that. And that's probably the biggest difference between the way I was raised and the way that I wanted to raise my children. I wanted them to feel that they could tell me anything and be heard. Having my mom as somebody who understands and like just being there, like if I need somebody to talk to and not having to lie to her about stuff, is so much better for me. Support from just one family member. Somebody to let you know that you'll still love no matter what. Uh, it's going to be all right it means a whole lot. I think that the most valuable support for any person could come from the family. In the absence of that, or in a, as a means of enhancing that, I think it's important to have agencies and centers that are for specific populations that might have some unique and emerging needs. I have young females that come in so beat up from the world, thinking that they are the worst persons. Oh, how could I have done that? I was with these four boys. And I said, baby, you've not done anything that I haven't done and half the other women in this office. You're in a good place. The judgmental sort of ugliness that even keeps folks from coming to church. Being a preacher's wife, we learned that, uh, I won't say the church is a culprit. The church is just is slow to turn, but they are listening. They are listening to what it is needed and what we can do to help our community. 90% of our staff is in recovery and living with HIV. So we just decided to use real people with real life experiences to go back and be an example by sight. But outreach showed me that it was more to do than just go back and forth to the doctor. I went to support groups. They went on trips, you know, and they just, outreach has done a lot for me, a whole lot. Outreach to me means unconditional love. It means truth. It means respect of all persons. And more than anything, it means unjudgmental support. They're the ones that showed me that my pain 
it helped somebody else not go through their pain as long. And that was the most important lesson in my life. It's what makes my life worth living to this day, and it makes it worth me crawling out of bed and just trying to figure it out one more day. It's my truth. It's my truth. Early on, I developed an interest in just people for who they were and their stories. And I realized early on that the better I treated people, the better I was treated. I look at a lot of my cousins, and you can't talk to them because they young, but I just try and talk to them and let them know, because I, I don't want to see them go through what I go through in life. You don't know, you have no idea what the other person has or not. I've always practiced it practice safe sex. If you're not tested, you're not going to be careful and you're not going to protect yourself and you keep passing it on and on and it has to stop. So I want all black men take responsibility. All black women take responsibility. Wear protection. Communication is very important. You can't just say, okay, this is my boyfriend, I'm going to have sex with him without a condom. You have to talk about the Ask him is he HIV positive or negative. If he says no, don't. that doesn't mean automatically trust him. One of the things we've asked women to do is to know something about their sexual partner so they can make some evaluation of whether or not their sexual partner has a chance of the, the transmitting a sexually transmitted disease to them. You have to protect yourself from somebody else's body fluids by all possible means if you made the decision to have sex. But the best thing to do is not have sex until you have got a mutual partner that you think you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And then go and get tested and see what you both are and have, and then make some decisions about sex. I just tell them, like, before I even go somewhere with somewhere, spend time with them, I tell them that I don't have sex and I'm not planning on having sex with them. I tell women, um, if the man is the complainer about this, here are the choices. You can feel something with this condom on, or you can feel nothing without it. We need to think about how we define our morality and then how we display our morality. The only thing you can do is try to make a difference in somebody else's life. I think that too many human beings live so separately of each other. You know, and that's an old cliche that people hear. I'm my brother's keeper, I think so. I really do. It really is important to become a teacher, to become a counselor, to become somebody who runs an after-school program, to become an activist, and to make those kinds of commitments with your life and with your time. We're born that we are so far behind in supporting people with the virus. Write a check. <laughs> Write a check. You want to do what we do. You want to get out on here the street. That's maybe that. That's not your skill. If you got a check, if you got a dollar, send it to somebody in this country doing this work. They need the support. Maybe you can't do that. Go and volunteer. Answer the phone. Cook a meal. Adopt somebody living with this disease. Get off your butt. Don't give me any more excuses about why you can't get involved. Our people are dying. What in the world is the matter with you? Get involved. Cut out all the excuses. It's my truth. It's my truth. I just want people to be safe when they do it, because it's just wrong if you try and do it uh, unprotected. And I'd like to see a place where I don't have to worry about my 14-year-old being hurt because of who he loves. I want for everyone to learn to love each and every one, no matter what the obstacles or their challenges are in life. And that when you come up in the world, wherever you might be, remember to reach down and pull someone else up with you. I probably wish that there was a cure for AIDS. Maybe not if, maybe if it didn't even save my family, just sort of save others in the world. There is much to be done from our community. We need to learn to heal ourselves. We're not waiting on any magic person to come in and solve this. We can solve it within our ranks by at least acknowledging that we are HIV positive and that we can do something about this. This is a preventable disease. We can take a stance that not one more infection is going to happen on our watch. I used to always ask God, let me live to see my baby turn five. And now he's nine, so maybe he'll let me live to see 10 more years. I want it over. I want it gone. If I can't get it gone, I want it manageable 
and everybody in the world to have access to health care. want everybody to be able to have a chance to have good health and good life. want everybody to be able to get the medicines without any cost. Well, to be doing that. I want people to be able to live. But I want to all leave on their heart that I fought to the end. And I shared my hopes and dreams for everyone, not just me living with it, but everybody's family support that person that is living with HIV. All of the struggles, all of the hard times, all of the things that are uniquely you speak to a unique and divine purpose. We complain about the bad day that we had or the bad childhood that we have. We don't put it into the um, whole grand scheme of things to say, if I was able to get through that, then part of my mission might be to help somebody else get through it making something of the rights that we fought so hard for, doing something with that. AIDS is about all of that. Until we get one thing right, we won't get the rest of it right.